based here in Richmond and one of the co-chairs of the Point Malate Alliance. As a contributing opinion writer for the Los Angeles Times and co-host of the Rising Tide Ocean podcast, David has offered to interview his friend and one of his heroes, Dr. Sylvia Earle. She's here today. Um, it's funny, I know that I've met Dr. Earle in the past and I've been racking my brain trying to remember where it was and I can't. All I can recall is thinking to myself, I just met Sylvia Earle. I just met <laughs> so now all of you can have that thought in your head too. So Dr. Earle is a renowned deep sea oceanographer, AKA her deepness, <laughs> because she holds the record for the deepest walk on the sea floor. She served as chief scientist of the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. And among her many honors, she's been the National Geographic Explorer at large for 25 years and was designated as the first hero of the planet by Time Magazine in 1998. She founded Mission Blue, which designates biodiversity hope spots around the world and fights to protect them. One of these hope spots is San Francisco Bay, so it includes the Point Malate shoreline. Page. Plus she writes children's books about the sea and has appeared in the comic strip Sherman's Lagoon. Please welcome David Helvarg and Dr. Sylvia Earle. Thank you. Thank uh, Sylvia and everybody for being here. Um, I guess it was just over a week ago that I was actually on the Big Island Hawaii body surfing and doing some shore dives because Sylvia once told me that you can't go a year without diving, you'll get dry rot. <laughs> so my last night, I took my friend Charlie out to dinner and uh, another friend, Susan, who's a flower grower outside Pahoa, which is about 50 minutes outside of Hilo and her husband, who's a carpenter, started talking about this documentary he'd just seen on Netflix. And there was this, this woman who like explored the deep ocean, but then she worked for the government, but the government lies, so she had to leave, but she <laughs> went on to do other things. And I said, yeah, it was called Mission Blue, right? Sylvia Earle, yeah, yeah, yo, you know her? And he's telling his wife how she has to watch this documentary. And I think that's the thing. I mean, I, I first interviewed Sylvia in, I think, 1992, story called uh, Conversations with uh, the Sturgeon General. She's been called her deepness, but I think ambassador for the ocean is the most accurate. Um, so just ask her a few questions. Um, before I do, I mean, we gotta recognize we're in the heart of a global climate emergency. I just interviewed folks from Florida who are, where the water hit 101 degrees. Noah's saying that uh, 44% of the world ocean right now is uh, experiencing marine heat waves. That'll go over 50% by September. Another report says that uh, melting of the uh, Greenland glaciers could uh, result in the uh, shutdown of the Atlantic circulation in this century, which would drive Northern Europe and New England into a new ice age, even as the world continues to overheat. Um, so I guess the... Uh, I guess one of the first questions is, um, you know, how do we stay hopeful, Sylvia? It's not over. <laughs> you can still breathe, right? I think this is the best chance humankind has ever had to find our place within the natural systems that make our existence possible. I say that because when I was a kid, nobody thought that we could do much to harm the ocean. We could use the ocean as the ultimate dump site, we still do. We could take anything we wanted to out of the ocean, it would always come back. It was also true with the land over most of our history. We've, we've made our prosperity possible because of what we take from the natural world. I mean, all creatures do. I mean, birds borrow twigs from trees. They eat their neighbors. That would be insects and seeds and things. You know, it's, 
one big eat and be eaten world out there, but no creature has ever reached the point of technological capability or numbers at a scale that really puts everybody else at risk, including ourselves. And it's happened mostly in my lifetime. I mean, as a witness to not just what appears to be human prosperity from two billion when I arrived, now we have four times that number of us. At the same time, look around. Almost everybody else is in decline except maybe things that really prosper from our existence. Think about the creatures who live in our homes from pesky cockroaches and <laughs> other creatures who really are pleased that we're here because we benefit them. Anyway, we know now what could not be known. Not only has there been a rise of our impact on the planet, but right now, 21st century, we're likely to be the very first humans to be able to see clearly the problems and therefore to act on solutions. Imagine if we didn't know. Imagine that we could not see and measure the reduction of ice in polar areas. I mean, I thought as a kid that Santa Claus would always be safe. It never occurred to me that, that the ice, not just in the Arctic, but in the Antarctic and mountaintops would ever change. And even Rachel Carson, when she wrote a book that I devoured when I was a, a kid, 1951, that the continents were pretty stable, that they don't move around. That was a discovery that took place, actually theory that the continents move around, plate tectonics, that what we see today is pretty much the way the world has always been. Issues of climate change were already beginning to be of some concern, even in Rachel Carson's time. But it's curious that now we mark, geologists tend to mark, the middle of the 20th century, the 1950s, as the time when things really changed so greatly that a new geological epoch has been named. That would be the Anthropocene. Here we are with one species, with the capacity through our technology and through our numbers, our appetite for wild animals, land and sea, and wild products, whether it's forests or minerals, whatever, it has scaled up dramatically. Imagine if we didn't know the impact, but now we do. That means I have hope that we can, we must, Take this knowledge and take it seriously. The biggest problem, I think, what do you think? Biggest problem is probably complacency, lack of really taking seriously the knowledge that's there. Yeah, I have to agree. I'm more frustrated and outraged than despairing because we know what the solutions are. It's creating the political will and the social will to enact them. I mean, we, we know that we're, we're literally changing the physical nature of the ocean. It's, it's temperature, it's chemistry, it's color, and it's circulation. Don't you think that political will follows social will? I mean, really, if enough people really take to heart, we will vote the right people into office. We will do what it takes to really demand that there be guidelines for behavior. You know, laws, the laws we have today perversely are governing a planet that doesn't exist anymore. I mean, the environmental laws. We can get away with a whole lot of stuff legally, <laughs> including overfishing, including just burning fossil fuels. We live in a time when we know better. We just have to demand that those who have the authority, and we have the authority, you have the authority, you have the power. It's using that power, right? Yeah. yeah. I agree. I remember at the 92 Earth Summit, there was a march at night of 30,000 people and a banner held by Buddhists with cell phones, which were unusual at the time. 
and the banner read, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. So in terms of, of hope, this administration, the Biden administration, is committed to 30 by 30, protecting 30% 30 of our land and ocean by 2030. And E.O. Wilson said that we need 50 by 50 to have a chance of survival. I know a lot of it is about what you advocate, hope spots. And maybe you can talk about hope spots, including a San Francisco hope spot. I've had the pleasure of advising E.O. Wilson that 50 by 50 is a good start. <laughs> and we can't go on just living our lives by consuming the natural world. We have to find our place. Right now, we're a throwaway society. Look at the questions about deep sea mining. It's as if, oh yeah, we need nickel and cobalt for the batteries that will take us to a clean, green economy. Well, if we do, why not mine what's already been mined? The metals don't degrade. They are infinitely able to be recycled. But is that what we've been doing? No. We just throw our old cell phones and batteries and things away. Where's away, David? Yeah, no way. No way, but... but uh... There are good signs. I mean, you've worked for 20 years. It's a high seas treaty now. There's that, that deep sea mining that was supposed to be authorized by the UN last month isn't because people are standing up. And sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, think globally, act locally. Now we have to act locally, regionally, globally, simultaneously. Sometimes like with Point Malati, save, save the earth 400 acres at a time. You, you've been involved in these hope spots that are protecting marine habitats all over the world. So maybe you can tell us something about a San Francisco Bay Hope Spot, what that might mean and where Point Melati's eelgrass fits in. Well, Mission Blue is not alone in coming up with a plan, a goal, a, an in initiative to try to protect nature. You think about national parks. Some say the best idea America ever had that was kind of contagious and around the world now, about 15% of the land has some form of pretty good protection. Not perfect, but pretty good. In the ocean, it's about 3%. 3%, that means 97% of the ocean that dominates climate, dominates biodiversity, dominates the chemistry, the temperature, it's our life support system, and we're only proactively saying that we're going to take the pressure off and protect about 3%. Well, 30% by 2030, people are kind of beginning to buy into that concept. The National Marine Sanctuary Program really does help in this country, but you can still take wildlife out of the marine sanctuaries. In fact, fishing is promoted, encouraged within the National marine sanctuaries. You're not encouraged to go into the national parks and shoot the birds and dig up the trees, but we have a long way to go to really effectively take what is already have, already has some form of protection and really protect it, really give the fish a break, really allow coral reefs to thrive in the far Florida Keys. Tiny fraction of the Florida Keys within the national marine sanctuary is really protected, where you can go and see lobsters, not just catch lobsters <laughs> or fish and so on. So here in San Francisco, the idea, like a number of other places around the world that have been designated, designated and actually have been proactively endorsed with a, a committee of volunteer scientists who review proposals that come in from champions, uh, citizens, communities all over the world. There are now 100 and, almost 160 hope spots that range from the Galapagos Islands, Palau, places that anybody who has any concern about nature at all might say, yeah, of course you want to protect and keep safe places that are still in pretty good condition. But it also includes a place in the shadow of the skyscrapers in New York, known as Shinnecock Bay. A collaboration with the Shinnecock Nation 
And with Stony Brook University, they, for the last 10 years, have been restoring the hard clams to restore the health of the bay because those clams used to keep the bay pretty clear. But they, they took them all. So much so, they couldn't even find a hard clam when they tried to kind of do an evaluation of what can we do to turn things around. They had to go elsewhere to bring some mama clams and papa clams in to start the renewal process. It's taken 10 years, but it is better today than it was five, 10, 20 years ago. The same is true here in San Francisco Bay. This is not exactly a pristine area like Palau, but there's plenty of reason for hope. And what we're gathered here today to look at a special place that could do a great deal to restore health, those seagrass meadows, they're just absolutely critical to generate oxygen, capture carbon, provide home and sustenance for a whole lot of creatures that we really need to not only have the place that we're targeting here, the Moati Bay, but also the whole bay. When you think about what the bay was like 500 years ago, or even 200 years ago, a little bit more, when you think about two years before the mast, Richard Henry Dana wrote about trees right down to the coast. <laughs> And the bay was much larger than it is now because much of it has been filled. I was sobered the day that I found right down downtown San Francisco a brass plaque right on there on the, in the sidewalk that said this was where the bay <laughs> once came. And knowing that where we now have skyscrapers, there are sunken ships and <laughs> the remains of old seagrass meadows under the cement. But there's still hope. There still is a bay, and it's still productive. And there's still a chance, really good chance. But first, you have to know that we've got a problem and that we've got solutions. Number one solution is take the pressure off of nature. Do what you can to give nature a break. And think of life in the sea the way we tend to think of life on the land as wildlife. And <laughs> I'm not talking about Saturday night at the bar, um, Friday night maybe, but wildlife, you know, and the birds, the trees, the creatures in the sea, sharks. Why is anybody even thinking of killing sharks? They're so important to the ocean, like whales. So, and we have harbor dolphins, harbor porpoises that have come back into the bay first time since World War II. Molly the otter is based on the otters we're seeing around Point Malati. The, uh, we've got um, plans now for reintroducing uh, sea otters. And I think that the river otters, you'll hear from Molly later, are a good indicator that the bay is healthy enough. Um, so I just, you know, coming back to our frustration with the system versus what could be. I'll just ask you one more time, what can this small crowd, other than buying some of these lovely photographs, books or raffle tickets, what, what, what can these people do immediately to help turn the tide? Anybody who asks me what can I do, I suggest, especially kids, and I'm looking at a bunch of kids here. <laughs> Look in the mirror, I cannot tell you what you can tell yourself. Because I don't know who you are. But I can say, I can ask, what have you got? Are you good with a camera to produce images that can document the state of the world and convey the beauty and importance of nature? Are you an artist otherwise? Do you have a way with words? Anybody can look at what the problems are and say, I can't do it all. I wish I could, but I can't. But I can do what I can do. I can use what I've got. Do you have a way with kids? Use that special, whatever it is. You have a way with critters. <laughs> Are you a whale hugger, or an otter hugger, or a seagrass hugger? Whatever it is, use what you've got. 
and show that you care. I mean, those who are in power of making decisions that will determine what happens through the power of governments, they really have to depend on the people that they're supposedly representing. But if you don't tell them, if you don't give them the knowledge that they need, then that's part of either the problem or the solution. That I'm probably as guilty as, as any, not knowing as a kid, not knowing as a teenager, or <laughs> even now, thinking that I had the power to do something that could make a difference. But just look at people as individuals who are making a difference and people who team up with others. You know, one plus one is not just two. It really does grow. A young woman in Texas, Linda Morinus, was really disgusted by all the trash on the beach. I don't know what she can do otherwise, but she could pick up that trash, and she did. Nobody told her, nobody said, you better pick that up, kid. <laughs> but all by herself, went out there and started picking it up and trying to put it where it could do no harm. And pretty soon, people started following her around, and it led ultimately, it probably would have happened, and maybe it is happening even now around the world, that somebody like Linda just says, I'm gonna clean this place up. <laughs> And it led to the, what was then the Center for Marine Conservation, starting with their beach cleanups. And it, it kind of took off. NOAA got on board and helped sponsor beach cleanups, coastal cleanups. Now it's international. I mean, we know for sure where that spark started. I can't tell you where all the other sparks are, but now people are aware. And we have a lot more to do. but. That's something anybody can do. Just think about what you're capable of. Nobody can do what you can do because there's only one you, and you're different from everybody else. <laughs> and that, too, is part of, I think, a cause for hope. Eight billion minds out there. I mean, eight billion people is sort of a problem in terms of feeding us and looking out for space and where do you get the water and all of that. But when you think, if we can get enough people to be concerned, to care about changing at a point in time when we never had a better chance than right now, it's going to get harder. But maybe there's something like a collective consciousness that we can work on. Enough people thinking and moving and acting in the right direction, even without the laws to enforce good behavior. People might just get on board. So just thank you, Sylvia, for following your passions your whole life, which has impassioned millions of others, which is where social movements begin to turn the tide. And uh, if everybody will just hang in for a few more minutes, uh, I got a couple of thanks for what we've been doing here. And uh, of course, you'll want to hear from Molly, the uh, river otter. Thank you again, Sylvia.